Morning, everyone. It's nice to be here again. I take it as a privilege that you allow me to come and share God's word with you. I take it very seriously, and it's good to be here. So before I ask this question, if some joker says it's Sunday, I know it's Sunday. But does anyone else know what today is? This very day today. Anything other than Sunday? <laughs> it is actually the Feast of Tabernacles, the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Right now, in Jerusalem, the Jews are celebrating this feast, the Messianic Christians are celebrating it, and many, many Christians throughout the world are trying to restore these things to the church, and they're celebrating it. But let me just share with you, briefly, the Feast of Tabernacles, if you remember, is when the people came out of Egypt. And we must never forget, we always seem to think it was the Jews that came out of Egypt, but it was a mixed multitude. There were lots of people that came out of Egypt, not just the Hebrew people. And all those that were covered by the blood, a lot of them came out of Egypt into the wilderness. And they stayed in the wilderness there in what they called tabernacles or booths or pondokis. I don't know, what do you want to call it in Afrikaans? But they would build, because they were always on the move, they would build very makeshift sort of coverings, probably not from the rain because it's the desert, but certainly from the sun and etc. And if you remember correctly, God actually came and dwelt with his people in the wilderness. There was the pillar of fire by night, and you had the cloud by day. And whenever this moved, they had to pack up their stuff and they had to go and follow the Lord. God's very presence was there. He wanted to speak with them at first, but they said, this is too scary for us. Let's just speak to Moses. So Moses met with the Almighty God and spoke with him. Now, that's why the Jews celebrate this feast. They look back on that. But this feast has a very, very prophetic day. There's going to come a day soon when the Lord returns, and he will tabernacle again with people, with men. And you'll see that there. And that's why they call it the greatest day of the year. Because it's the last feat and it's on the eighth day. And eight, the number eight in, in, in the Jewish faith, in the biblical faith, not the Jewish faith, the biblical faith, is new beginnings. So when he returns, it will be new beginnings for everybody. The prophetic word in the church, to me, is dead and buried. There just is no prophetic word in the church. There are some churches that are quite big on that sort of thing, but as a whole it's dead. And I think the reason that it's dead is because it's so controversial and, and pastors tend to stay away from it because it just causes trouble and churches have split on those sort of things. So that's a pity. But the prophetic word has a very, very good reason why it's there, which I'll explain to you in a moment. Shani, can I ask you to come and read the Bible reading? Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14. For I know what I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. When you call out to me and come to me in prayer, I will hear your prayers. When you seek me in prayer and worship, you will find me available to you. If you seek me with all your heart and soul, I will make myself available to you, says the Lord. Then I will reverse your plight and will regather you from the nations and all the places where I have exiled you, says the Lord. I will bring you back to the place which I exiled you. Revelations 21, 1-4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth had ceased to exist, and the sea existed no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Look, the residence of God is among human beings. He will live among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will not exist any more. All mourning, all crying, all pain, for the former things have ceased to exist. That certainly is something to look forward to, isn't it? Why does God give us prophecy in the Bible? The reason he gives us prophecy is very simple. He tells us the end from the beginning. He doesn't say, I'll tell you the beginning to the end. He says, I'll tell you the end from the beginning. So he knows everything 
along the way. And he tells us to give us an expected end. He tells us these things so that we can have an expected end. And believe me, there's a big difference between an expected end and an unexpected end. If I can just share a little bit of a fictional story with you. Let's say you go to want to see your children in Australia. So you go to the travel agent, you get your visas, everything's done, and you look at the thing and you say, in 30 hours' time, I should be with my children in Australia. That is your expected end. But now this is what happens. You leave here on the day that you're supposed to go to the George Airport, and you just passed Bortercliff there, and you realize you've forgotten your passport and your money at home. It's not too bad. Bortercliff is just a little bit out here, and you've given enough for yourself enough time. So you turn around and you go back, but already your heart is pounding a little bit because things are not going well. Then you're on your way, and just before Mossel Bay, there's a huge felt fire there, and the smoke is billowing across the road, and the traffic is backed up for two or three kilos. They won't let anyone go through because there's no visibility. And now time is really getting bad, and eventually you miss your flight from George to Johannesburg. Then you have to stay over in George that night. And after much anxiety and phoning on your telephone to try and rearrange tickets because you've missed your flight to Australia, you eventually get that all done, and the cost for that change and everything is about 8,000 rand. And so you spend the night over. This trip is not going well. You get to Johannesburg the next night, and they say that the flight to Australia is, is also cancelled to the next day, so you've got to spend another night in Johannesburg. Eventually, you get on the flight, and you're sitting back, and you're just relaxing. They come around and offer you a drink, and just over the, the ocean on the way past India, I assume we go past India, I think we do, the guy comes on the thing, and he says they've got a problem in the engine. It's not serious. But we have to land in India to get spare parts to get this fixed. Now, this trip is really not going well, you must admit. And on the way to India, you're getting closer and the thing starts losing altitude. I don't know if you've ever been in a plane when that happens. I have. It can drop and it's a scary thing. And so you're thinking to yourself, he says this is not serious, but something tells you this is not lacquer. And then he comes on and he says, it is more serious. Please buckle up, etc. Anyway, I won't get this. Let us go too long. You land in India, you spend three nights in India in a hotel there that is, <laughs> that a hotel is about as bad as that noise. Eventually you get to Singapore, and by the time you get to Singapore, there's a lot of people on the plane that have really had enough of this trip now, and the airline says to them, we'll give you a flight back to Johannesburg. If you want, if you've had enough and stuff like that, you can fly directly back to Johannesburg and make rearrangements. 80% of the people do that because they're on business and the whole reason why they were there is gone. So they go back to Johannesburg. You eventually get to Australia and you meet up with your folks and they just tell you that they left your luggage in India. It'll be there a week later. That is what you call an unexpected end. You thought you'd be there in 30 hours, it's now one week later, and you've been through a nightmare. That's what you call an unexpected end. Now I want to show you what an expected end looks like. Let's just rewind that whole story. I'll try and make it shorter. You're about to leave still by, and someone from the church comes to you and says, I had a dream last night, an angel appeared to me, and this is what they've told me. They told me that on your trip, you're going to forget your passport there by Bordeaux don't forget it, remember to take it with you. But by the time you get to Mossel Bay, the smoke's going to be so much, you're going to miss your flight. You're going to have to spend an extra night in George, and it's going to cost you 8,000 rand or whatever. On the way to India, you're going to have engine trouble, but don't worry, it's not going to crash. You will land, and you're going to end up in a really lousy hotel. And so it goes on, and then you get to Singapore, he says... You will get a flight to Australia. Most of the people are going to want to turn back, but you don't turn back. You carry on to Australia. Your luggage is going to be missing. But here comes the good part. When you get to Australia, the airline is going to say to you, for all the trouble we've caused you, your flights, flights are for free. He has $20,000. We're giving you a free week at the Great Barrier Reef in a great hotel for nothing in a reward for all the trouble that you've had. Okay, so the first one, unexpected end. Drama, much heartache. The second one, you now know what's going to happen. So when you get on the way to, to George, you know that there's going to be a fire there. You know you're going to miss the flight. And you know everything that goes along the way, and you don't have to worry because you've been told it. 
And when you get to Singapore and everyone wants to turn back, you can say to them, listen, the prophet told me what's happened and he's been 100% right. Don't turn back. He's a nice reward waiting for you at the end. But they turn back anyway. That's the difference between an expected end and an unexpected end. And God gives us prophecy so that we have an expected end. We know what's coming. If you know what's in your scripture, you will never be taken by surprise. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, you know what you have planned for us, your children. You have plans to prosper us and not to harm us. You have plans to give us a future filled with hope. And you have promised that when we call out to you in prayer, you will hear our prayers. You have promised when we seek you in prayer and worship you with all our heart and soul, you will make yourself available to us. And so as the Apostle Paul said, Lord, who, if you are for us, who can be against us? or trouble, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or danger. No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. This day today is a day that God commanded all his people to, it's a command to be joyous. And you can see why, because of the promise at the end of this. It's very prophetic. Our Christ, our King, will return, and he will rule and reign from this earth. And this is what the New Testament tells us. And it tells us us through the feasts. People don't realize that the feasts of Israel are God's prophetic timetable, all seven of them. And I hear the church say we don't celebrate the feasts. That is true. But only half true, because we do celebrate four of them. But I'd like to give you a bit of a foundation of the feasts. There's not much detail here, so please bear with me. We need to set up a foundation. Firstly, we need to clear up this word feast. It's not a feast as in overeating and drinking and going mad and having parties and things like that. Number two, they are often called the feasts of Israel. That's incorrect. They are God's feasts for all people. Number three, the word in Hebrew for feast that they've translated feast is called moed, moed or Moedim in plural, it means appointed times. God says there are his appointed times. He's made appointed times from the beginning to the end that certain things are going to happen, and they do happen, and when they happen, we can have faith in him. It's like an appointment book he's got there, and he shares it with us. Number four, you'll see in your Bible, if you've got the old King James, it talks about a convocation. These feasts are a convocation, a holy convocation. That word has a few meanings, but the main meaning for this purpose, it means rehearsal. These feasts are rehearsals, and you might say, rehearsal for what? Well, it's a rehearsal for what's coming. If you speak to Alvain and them, they've got the monochore, they are practicing twice a week now for the monochore, because they're going to have the big day in November, and so they're practicing for the big day, so that when the big day comes, they can do it. That's what these things are, a rehearsal for us. These moed are God's timetable, his calendar. They are designed to prepare God's people for each age. There are various ages. We're in the last age. And these feasts and these prophetic things are designed to prepare us for these ages. Let me give you a brief history. These appointments were set up by God when Israel was in the wilderness, around 1,500 years before Christ, or 3,500 years from now. There were seven of them, as you can see there. These appointments, which are also called rehearsals, were repeated for 1,500 years. I'm not sure whether Israel knew they were prophetic or if they just got to a point where they were just doing it out of, uh, we had to do it, God said we must do it, so we must do it. I don't know. But then something happened 1,500 years after they started doing it. It's called, in the fullness of time, these things became a reality. Ephesians says the following, and I didn't put it up there, but this is what it says. It says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, or that in the age of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, the church says they don't... <laughs> celebrate these feasts, but we do, just with different names. That year, 
in 30 AD, 30 AD, some say 31, some say 32, doesn't matter. You know what I'm talking about when Jesus came that year for the Passover. The appointments were kept by God with man. The first one is Passover, what we call Easter. I prefer the Afrikaans version of that, Passphias. I think it's a much better word. On the day, on the day that the high priest of the temple sacrificed that lamb, at the very moment he was sacrificing that lamb, Jesus was crucified for the sin of the world at the exact time. Forty years later, this, fest, this sacrificial thing went on for 40 years. Now, if you know your Bible, you'll know that 40 is a time of testing. Forty years later, our Lord flattened the temple so that there were no more animal sacrifices, and there haven't been to this day. It was the end of animal sacrifices. Our Lord is the final sacrifice. God set up an appointed time for his people, and they celebrated it for 1,500 years. It was prophetic of the coming Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled it on the day, in real time, here on earth. That's the first one, done and dusted. The next moed, or appointment, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, celebrated on the day after Passover. This is a very lovely feast. I think the picturesque of it is fantastic. The father of the household takes some leaven, which is yeast, and he hides it in various places in the house, and then he tells his family to go and find this yeast and to collect it together. And they take it and they put it in a cloth when they found it, because yeast is represented of sin. And they take this cloth full of this yeast and they go outside and they bury it in the garden. That was the day our Lord Jesus was buried in the tomb with the sin of the world on him. Very symbolic. So, another one fulfilled in real time. Zap. First fruits. First fruits is on the Sunday. This too is a great, great feast. The, the priest of the temple, it's the end of the barley harvest. and The barley is now ripe and ready for picking. But before they can pick it, they have to dedicate it to God. So the priest goes out, he takes in what they call an omer, a big bunch of the barley. And he goes back to the temple and he waves it before God. And the idea of that is to find if this is acceptable to God. And then if it is acceptable to God, if it is acceptable to God, this means that the whole harvest is acceptable. Now we know Paul tells us very clearly, Jesus is our first fruits. He's the first fruits from the resurrection of the dead. And because he was acceptable to God, remember they came to him, the ladies, and they said they wanted to touch him. He said, don't touch me because I haven't yet been to the Father. Because when he went to the Father, he took his sinless life as a sacrifice and our Father found him totally acceptable. Okay? And the harvest... The rest of the harvest, that's us. That's all of us sitting here. All of those who know the Lord, who love the Lord, and do their best to obey the Lord because they love him. We the harvest. He's coming for the harvest. What a fantastic festival. Right. Done. <laughs> the next one is called, in Hebrew, Shavuot. It means Feast of Weeks. The reason they call it Feast of Weeks is because they had to wait seven weeks, which is 49 days. And on the 50th day, they were to celebrate this feast. That's why we call it Pentecost for 50. 50. Penta means 50. On this day, funny enough, the priest, they baked a loaf of bread, and this time it had yeast in it. They were told to put yeast in it. And I believe, and I'm not sure, I can't, can't verify this, but I think the reason for that is that it represents man, man full of sin. And on that day, the Holy Spirit came, the third person of the Trinity came down, to the people. And we know all that happened in Acts. In power and in force, that day happened. And he came down to drive the leaven out of us, to take up residence in us, and to make us more like Christ, and to drive the leaven out of us, to drive the sin out of us. So, those, three, those four are completed. The church says they don't celebrate the feasts. That's not true. We celebrate all. All four of those. We just don't call them by the names that the Jews do. That's all. But we do celebrate it. And it's good to celebrate it. Because it's a looking back to our Lord to thank Him for everything that He's done for us. But it's looking backwards. They are done. These three there, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles, are still to happen in real time 
on this earth. Paul says in Colossians, a lot of people misunderstand what he says there because he's talking about don't um, let people judge you on holy days and food. What he's actually saying there, there were a bunch of Jews there who were trying to make these feast days, they were trying to make them into holy sort of religious things. Paul's saying it's not that. He says keep the feasts, but the substance is Christ. Okay? So he, he says keep the feasts because they are a shadow of things to come. But the substance is Christ. We must never forget that. It's not some religious thing that we do. The substance is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for me, here comes a tragedy. A real tragedy in the church, in my opinion. You know, John speaks, John the Apostle, John in his three epistles, he speaks about the Antichrist. He says, the Antichrist is already here, the spirit of the Antichrist. is already here in the church and in the world. And then he goes on to tell you. But I found a scripture there I was looking at, which I found very, very interesting. And I apologize for not putting it up there. I thought I had it up there, but I only saw this morning that I didn't. But you can read with me if you want to. 3 John 1. 3 John 1. That's the book before Revelation, I think. 3 John 1. He says, and we're going we're to go through this carefully because it's very interesting. He says, I wrote something to the church. This is John. I wrote something to the church. I'd love to know what he wrote. He says, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not acknowledge us. <laughs> I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes. You can see that Diotrephes is, a, is a, a, a Greek. It's a Greek name. So he's a Gentile. And you know, remember the Lord said, don't be like the Gentiles. They like to lord it over the people. And I think our Lord was talking about the people in the world, not people in the church. But it looks like someone crept in there. Look what he says there. Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not acknowledge us. So you've got this guy in the church who has decided to hijack the church. He wants to be first among them. He's a Gentile. And he says he doesn't acknowledge the Apostle John. Doesn't acknowledge him. Can you imagine if the Apostle John, we said, the Apostle John, the guy who wrote the Gospel, these three things and the book of Revelation, and he came to Stillby, and we said he's coming to our church on Sunday, and the leader of the church stands up and says, we don't acknowledge him, we're not interested in him. And look, <laughs> look what he says further. Okay, John says, therefore I come, if I come, if I come, I'm not surprised he said, if I come, I will call attention to the deeds he's doing, the bringing of unjustified charges against us with evil words. But now listen what he says now. And not being content with that, he not only refuses to welcome the brothers, that's the Apostle John and the Jews that were with him, himself, but he hinders the people who want to do so and throws them out of the church. So can you imagine? I tell you the Apostle John's here, and someone stands up in this church and says, we don't acknowledge him, we're not interested in him. And just for the record, any of you who entertain him when he comes here, when he goes to the Enchir Kerk, and any of you who put up any of these guys, I'm going to kick you out of the church. That's what's going on here. Now, what is going on here? I don't know exactly what's going on. So one should never speculate with the Bible, because it says there, I wrote something to the church. We don't know what that something is. But I suspect it was the start, because this is a Greek guy, Diotrephes, he's a Greek guy. He's a Gentile. I suspect it was the start of the rift between the Jews and the Gentiles. But what I do know is this. That was at the end of the first century. By the middle of the second century, the split in the church between the Jews, Christ, the Jewish Christians and the, the Gentile Christians had become very bad. By the middle of the second century, the third century, it had become so bad that there was no Jews left in the church. I don't know what happened to the Jewish peoples where they were. We, we, we don't hear much about that in secular history. You can read all this. So what I'm talking about here now is fact. And it got to so bad that up to now they would have been keeping all those feasts. But now came a break. They decided that they're going to keep the first four. And they're going to call it Easter and all that sort of thing. And to make sure that they don't do it on the same day as the Jews. They developed a system called the Quattro Decimans or something. It was a thing how you count the dates. And the idea was to make sure that they separated it from the Jews. And so this separation was complete. 
And then, of course, they introduced something which I think is an abomination, personally. I don't know how you feel about it. We celebrate a feast, a feast of overindulgence, so the world has come to see, a feast of wine and a feast of whatever you want to call it. It's not one of God's appointed times. You won't find it on his calendar. This is a man-made event, a tradition. And what's worth, it's a fraud. And it's a fraud because of this. It's celebrated on a pagan festival day called the summer solstice. It is not Jesus' birthday. We don't know when his birthday is. There were not three magi at his birth. There were lots of magi. The word, the the figure three comes in because of the three gifts. And when they met him, he was two years old. It wasn't even on his birthday. It was two years later when they met him. The whole thing is a misrepresentation of the facts. And I can't help but think of the parable of the wheat. You know the parable of the wheat and the tares? Where the workers came to the owner of the farm and they said, didn't you put good seed in there? And he said, yes, I did. And he said, where did all the tares come from? And the, and the owner of the farm says, this has been put in there by the enemy. And they say, should we pull it out? And he says, no, don't pull it out. Leave it there until the end. When the end of the age comes, the angels will pull them out and send them to their destruction. So I guess we're going to be stuck with Christmas until the end. The question is, why did this happen? Why this big split? That's the question you've got to ask yourself. I believe it's this, okay? Satan wants you to see Jesus as the eternal baby in a cot. The harmless little baby. The gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But in reality, when he returns, he returns in vengeance as a judge to destroy the wicked. And he's going to judge us, not for salvation, but it says very clearly that we must stand before him to give an account for our works. We are saved. We will be in the kingdom. But we have to give an account. And then he's coming to kick Satan off the throne of this world and to take up his rightful position as king of kings and lord of lords. And that is what the book of Revelation is all about. And I want to show you who John sees. Revelation 1. This is the Jesus John sees. He says, I turned to see whose voice was speaking to me. And when I did so, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man. He was dressed in a robe extending down to his feet, and he wore a golden belt around his chest. His head and hair were as white as wool, even as white as snow, and his eyes were like a fiery flame. His feet were like polished bronze. Bronze always showed judgment. Refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. He held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp double-edged sword extended out of his mouth. It's that same sword that you hear about in Hebrews that divides between what you're thinking and your motives. His face shone like the sun, shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell down at his feet as though I were dead. But he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And the one who lives, I was dead. But now, look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. Our Lord Jesus Christ is our resurrection. Now, my problem with the church is they've developed this little circle, a little loop. They do the first four feasts, as you saw, then they jump to Christmas, and then they go back to the Passover. And the reason is, I believe, is to keep Jesus the eternal baby. No one ever talks him about him as the judge. He's the Jesus that's going to help you, he's going to fix you, he's going to make your lifestyle lacquer, he might even give you a Mercedes-Benz, at second best a BMW. But this is the Jesus that the people are looking for, not the real one. And I believe it was designed there to keep that in mind. Jehovah God, our Heavenly Father, has three more feasts, three more appointments with man. Three more rehearsals. These things are rehearsals. That's what the convocation means. They're called the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I won't go into much detail. I'm nearly finished. These have not yet been fulfilled in real time here on earth, but they will soon. If the first four, as you saw, were fulfilled in real time on the earth, I can assure you the last three will be done on the days. The book of Revelation is built around seven feasts. If you have a look at the book of Revelation, I only saw this lately. We did Revelation last year, and I saw that John builds it like on the pillars of those feasts. 
especially the last three. And it's full of imagery from these feasts. For example, the Feast of Trumpets starts. The Jews will take 40 days. They will blow a shofar for 40 days. And the idea is that when you hear the shofar, you go into your closet. And it's just between you and God. And they want you to examine yourself. It's called the Days of Awe. They want you to really have a look at your behavior, who you are, etc., and to come to a repentance of 40 days. And then comes at the end of that the last trump. If you people know about the rapture and you know the last trump, I believe that's a signal of that. And then after that comes the day of atonement, the day of justice, the day of judgment. And for those who are not covered by the blood of Jesus will be in trouble. And then, of course, comes the Feast of Tabernacles which huge imagery is, I'll go with you in a moment. Now, I know this of these because let's have a look at Revelation. We're not going to go through the scriptures. But Jesus tells us to examine ourselves, the seven churches. You know the seven churches of Revelation? Where Jesus comes and he says, this I like, this I like, that I don't like, that I repent or else. And he tells you what the rewards will be. It's an examination of the church. Now imagine if we celebrated that feast and we spent a month of preaching on that, of examination. Is our church, where is our church? How do we stand on that? Let's repent of that. That's what it should be all about. And then you have the feast of the Day of Atonement. Sorry, 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 I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Then we see in Revelation 5, we see the lamb that was slain. The imagery is right out of the Passover feast. In Revelation 5, the lamb is standing before the throne and he's been given the the. the the title deeds to the earth, you could say. And that's right out of the Passover feast. And just before the last, the last day of, on the Day of Atonement, I believe we see the rapture. I really do. Tell me this is not the rapture. Revelation 7, 9. After these things I looked, and here was an enormous crowd that no one could count, made up of persons from every nation, tribe, people, and language, Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in long white robes. And look at this next verse. And with palm branches in their hands. Now if you know your feasts, you will know that palm branches are the Feast of Tabernacles. They had palm branches and they would wave these things and it was, it's to do with that. And it's also to look back when they had these temporary shelters. And it was this that when Jesus rode in on the donkey on the Passover... The people were waving prawn on. That's out of, it's not supposed to be there. But the reason I believe was is because the previous five months, our Lord spent the tabernacles with them. And that's where he cried out, I'm the living water, da, da, da. And I think the people realized that. And that's why they waved prom branches, waiting for him to come. And the, and the Pharisees said to him, stop these people doing that. And the reason they said that is because it's out of place. It wasn't supposed to be there. It's supposed to be on the, on the day of tabernacles. And Revelation 9, I think 10, I just read it, hey? They had palm branches in their hands. They were shouting out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, to the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And now comes the Day of Atonement. Okay? Tell me this is not the Day of Atonement. Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and here came a white horse. The one riding it was called Faithful and True. And with justice he judges and goes to war. His eyes are like a fiery flame. We saw that in the beginning there. And there were many diadem crowns on his head. He has a name written that no one knows except himself. He's dressed in clothing, dipped in blood. And he is called the word of God. The armies that are in heaven, dressed in white, clean, fine linen, were following him on white horses. That's us. From his mouth extends a sharp sword so that he can strike the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He has promised us we will rule with him with a rod of iron. And he stomps the winepress of the furious wrath of God, the all-powerful. He has a name written on his clothing and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. And finally, Revelation 21 describes the eighth day this very day that they're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, there will come a day when this becomes real, in real time. Listen what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth had ceased to exist, and the sea existed no more. 
And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the residence of God is among human beings. The residence of God is among human beings. He's come down to earth to live with us. He will live among them, and they will be his people and God. He himself will be with them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death will not exist anymore, or mourning or crying or pain, for the former things have ceased to exist. This is the eighth day. Imagine if we celebrated. Now, please imagine with me. I'm, I'm finished. Last page. Promise. Can you imagine if we celebrated these feasts and people outside come to say, why do you do this? And you tell them, I'm celebrating the Feast of Trumpets because I must be prepared for my Lord. I must rid myself of all sin in my life. And then you tell them, when you say, why do you do the Day of Atonement? Because a judgment is coming, folks. If you're not covered by his blood, you're going to be judged. And you've got a problem. But for those who are covered by the blood, you're through. And then they say to you, why do you keep the Feast of Tabernacles? And you can say to them, because God lived with them in, in the wilderness, and he's coming back again to live with us. We will have eternal life. There will be no more pain, no more death, no more anything. That's what we're waiting for. Now, I started off with an unexpected end, and I showed you what an unexpected end looks like. Now, we have an expected end. That is what is waiting for us. Don't be like those guys in Singapore who said, I've had enough of this and turned back. You've got to go to the end. And it's funny, I'm ending with this, that the church is not preparing the people for what's coming ahead. The Bible tells us very clearly there are going to be bad times coming ahead. There's going to be difficult times. And Jesus says that many, many will turn away. They tell me that the actual Greek says, Carl J. can look for me, I'm not a Greek person. He says that most will turn away. Oh, they tell me, I'm not too sure. But it, the, script, the thing says many. And they will turn away because they are not expecting what's coming. And it's because the church does not preach it. But if we kept those feasts and we focused on those sort of things, then you will have an expected end. You will know what's coming. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 29, if you read it, he says there, God says to him, go and tell the people, you've got prophets there that are telling the people everything's going to be okay. There's going to be nothing wrong. You're going to live well. He says, I want you to go and tell those prophets that they're liars. They're not speaking from me. He says, this is what I want you to tell them. I want you to tell them that first the Assyrians are going to come and then the Babylonians and they're going to flatten your cities and they're going to flatten the temple and most of you will die and they're going to take some captive. That's what God said Go and tell them. So you've got the false prophets. Everything's going to be okay. And then you've got the truth. And when the trouble hits, if this is the last generation, which I suspect it is, and when the trouble hits, the prophets will be telling them, don't worry, we can pray to God to take these things away. But you can't pray to him. It is him that's bringing these things. But if you know your prophecy, if you know what's coming, you have an expected end. And my last scripture I think it's on there. Colossians 3, 4. I can give you another 10 scriptures that tell you the same thing. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above. I've heard many people say, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Let me tell you, that's a deception. It's the other way around. He's so earthly minded, he's no heavenly good. That's the problem. So Paul says, therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, what he's saying there is that when you were baptized in Christ, your old life was dead, you're now born again. That's what he means by raised with Christ. We are born again. We have his spirit living in us. He says, keep, not do it once in a while. He says, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Keep, keep thinking about things above, not things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. And listen to this beautiful one, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you too will be revealed in glory with him. That revealing in glory is when you are raised from the dead 
with a body just like Christ's, unperishable, no more pain, no more death, etc. And that is, I believe, why the church should celebrate those three feasts, because it is a rehearsal for the things to come. But tough times are coming, and many will turn away. Thank you for listening to me. Let's just end in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to see these things in your word, Lord. We don't keep the feasts, Lord, out of some religious law or something like that. It's a rehearsal, Lord. We want to prepare ourselves for the things to come. That when these things come upon us, we have an expected end, not an unexpected end, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have told us the end from the beginning so that we know. Praise you, Lord. I just pray a blessing on everyone here that they will see it through to the end. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I, I thought I, I asked Bruce if I can just speak because, I mean, now the question remains, so why do we then celebrate Christmas at, at Still Bay Baptist Church? And if you'd like to find out more about that, I preached a sermon on it at the end of November, and I mean, Bruce is happy with me speaking now, that we celebrate Christmas and we will celebrate Christmas because it's an opportunity. We do not believe it is the be-all and end-all of everything. We, and I agree with Bruce, it's become so much. And in that sermon I address, what do we do with a world that celebrates it wrong? But you know what? There are no heathen days. There are only God's days. And for on 25th, we have 400 people that rock up and say, tell us about Jesus. How on earth can we say, no, we don't like this day. Go away. We will use every opportunity this society, this culture gives us to proclaim Jesus. And you will hear, if you come to our Christmas services, we preach the gospel. If people want to come here, we're going to tell them about Jesus. But let that not be the center of what Christianity is. And for culture, that is so much. Let's do it better. Let's use it as a witness. And now, may the God of peace, who by the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ, equip you with every good thing to do his will, working in us what is pleasing before him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen.